WrestleManias. WrestleManias 7, 8, and 9. We're going to discuss on Wrestle Rides with Mike. I'm not going to give you an analysis of every Rick Martella versus Coco Beware or, you know, the Berserker versus, I want to say Kerry Von Erich, but that match didn't happen. I'm just going to give you personal memories of WrestleMania 7, 8, and 9. From a man, a fan who lived through it, baby. WrestleMania 7. This was the first WrestleMania I watched, I guess you could say, in another state. I watched this WrestleMania in Florida. The state of Florida, the city was Orlando. I was with friends, and we were underage drinking in a hotel room. Somehow watching WrestleMania on pay-per-view in a fucking hotel, believe it or not. So, and what were we drinking? We were drinking beer that we took with us on a train ride from Virginia to Florida for spring break. So this type of contraband and goofiness, you're not going to get these days. Three high school kids drinking beer... That's probably well past its expiration point. Milwaukee's best at its finest. Milwaukee's beast. Fucking contraband that had taken a train ride with it that we put on fucking ice in this hotel room. And we had gone to, uh, I think, Universal Studios or fucking Epcot Center or something that day. And here we are in a hotel. And the big debate of the day was, do we milk this fucking day for all that it's worth? and do some other shit, and then wait till watch this WrestleMania until nighttime, which I be- I want to say WrestleMania 7 was a Sunday night, or do we watch the replay, or do we watch the regular telecast, and I think at some point, after much deliberation, we might have discovered that, for whatever the fuck reason, we could get the live, you know, 7 o'clock, or whatever the fuck time thing it was, the regular, the regular live version, but we could not get the replay, so we opted to fucking reel it in, so to speak, get there for seven and watch this pay-per-view, from what I remember, I mean, this WrestleMania 7 has been discussed a lot, um, it was the controversial Sergeant Slaughter, Hulk Hogan, Gulf War, you know, General Adnan, Saddam Hussein, the whole nine yards, not that Saddam Hussein was actually in WrestleMania, but he was a theme. Um, WWE really pushed some boundaries. And I think the whole big schmaltz was, you know, if, if you don't know, the many people discussed it. They were going to do this pay-per-view in the LA Sports Coliseum, I believe it's called, the, where I, I think where the either the Raiders played or it's just this giant fucking coliseum, like 100,000 seats or a college football team in LA or somebody played there. And then they just weren't selling the tickets. And at the same time, you know, it depends on who you ask. If it was the low ticket sales or if it was <clears throat> threats to Sergeant Slaughter, uh, his, his body, you know, his health from enraged fans who were so upset. So they moved the fucking show indoors. And apparently they had just sold enough. And, you know, Bruce Pritchard tells the story. And congratulations to him and, and Conrad on something uh, else to wrestle on the wrestling, on the network and all that. But um, he's told the story. A lot of people have told the story that they had just sold just enough seats that if they made this change to an indoor arena... It would just about work out. And to be honest, I had no problem with it. As a fan, sure, the spectacle, but just watching on TV it doesn't matter um, for the most part. And I kind of like some of those indoor arena WrestleManias because uh, they just have a tighter feel to them and it just seems like less hokiness or, or, I don't know, I like all WrestleManias pretty much, but I mean, I like WrestleMania 7. It was a tight show. Uh, they really seem to be building to those two big matches, meaning Sergeant Slaughter versus Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior versus Randy Savage. And even now when people talk about the whole, you know, there's a whole generation of fans that are so brainwashed by WWE or WWF pay-per-view formatting that they get so hung up on 
the main event has to close the show and you know I've done another video about that but basically I saw a rabbit cross the street but basically on this particular show there was none of that nonsense it was just hey um, you know whatever the fuck it was just like the, the fucking warrior savage match stole the show so for people that piss on the ultimate warrior which I don't appreciate or they have hatred towards him they belittle his wrestling um, I'll just have you know that, you know, at least for one WrestleMania, it's unquestioned that the Warrior Savage match really did steal the show. <clears throat> for WrestleMania 6, Hogan and Warrior obviously was the best match. And WrestleMania 5, you can make a case that Rude and Warrior was the best match. Uh, it was a little bit better than Hogan Savage, if you want. So anyway, WrestleMania 7, Power and Glory. You expect me to say that, did you? Paul Roma and the Mighty Hercules tag teaming. I liked Power and Glory. Uh, Paul Roma, in my book, was a great tag team wrestler, especially, and with fucking Herc, Hercules Hernandez, okay? Great team, and what I didn't know at the time was that they lost, I think, the match in either 59 seconds or a minute and one second. There was some weird time. I think it was 59 seconds. They fell to the demolition and device and only years later did I hear Paul Roma do an interview I think on the Stone Cold Steve Austin podcast where Roma said that both he and Herc were very injured like shouldn't have even been wrestling shouldn't have been near a ring and they felt that they were forced to go in there and, and wrestle and fulfill their obligation and so that's why they did this one minute match and I, I don't know if, I can't remember I think Roma did take the, the, the doomsday device and he said he wasn't feeling great doing it didn't want to do it but this is a tough fucking business. So hats off to them, although I'm not wearing a hat, that they fucking did that. But at the time, just as a fan, not knowing any better, I was pretty pissed. Because I did like the Legion of Doom. I were ha I was happy they were in the WW fucking F. But I didn't like seeing a good team like Power and Glory go down so easily. Other matches, I think Slick was there at ringside. Other matches on the undercard... Um, and I'm not going, I don't have any Google device in front of me. Just go remembering fucking um, Jake the Snake and Martell in that blindfold match, which was really quite god awful. I mean, there was stumbling and bumbling, and it was a gimmick match. And I think Jake somehow won with a DDT, but it was really a bad match in a lot of ways because you had two pretty damn good performers. I mean, of the, the mid card or upper mid card talent, I don't know if there could be a better set up than Jake the Snake and Martell. I mean, you got Jake the Snake from Georgia and Mid-South, Martell with all, all that AWA experience, and, and now as a heel, you had a really good angle for these guys with the whole uh, blinding incident and snakes and all types of shit. It could have just been a, a snake pit match or something of that nature. Instead, it was this hokey doke fucking blindfold match. Blindfold matches very rarely work. Um... What else? I think Andre the Giant, you know, Andre the Great One, made his final WrestleMania appearance, I want to say, at WrestleMania 7. He came out to help the boss man, and I think the boss man got a DQ victory, big boss man. He's, he's deceased now, too, over Kurt Henney, and he's gone now, too. A lot of guys at WrestleMania 7 are no longer with us, even, even Hercules, I mentioned earlier, and Hawk. Um, fucking, was, was Earthquake at WrestleMania 7? I'm drawing a little bit of a blank, to be honest with you. Um, he must have been, I think. I just got my timelines all fucked up. Um, fucking who else? They had a couple of Japanese guys, uh, obviously, against Demolition. They beat Demolition. Was it a couple of, of top guys? I, I mean, sorry, Meltzer. I can't fucking remember if it was Tatsunumiji Fujinami or someone... Um, a couple of top, you know, Japanese guys beat Demolition rather handily. Um, I don't want to forget anything, but I'm sure I will. But just for me and everyone, if you were watching that fucking Savage, Elizabeth, Sherry Martell, Ultimate Warrior thing, you were seeing some fucking great storytelling. Years in the making. Great angle. Great match. Um, just a tight fucking match. And, and honestly, it's right up there for me with the Savage Steve match at WrestleMania 3. I mean, you can, you can make a case that that Warrior Savage match 
was probably better, you know, move for move, pound for pound, by a sliver over the Hogan match at six for Warrior. Maybe the crowd response of the Sky Dome puts that, that Hogan match, you know, bigger situation. And you could probably make a case that the Savage Steamboat match was, was quintessential, but not that it's fucking Sophie's choice, you know what I mean? Why choose? I mean, that, that Savage Warrior match, what a great fucking match. And honestly, my friends started to conk out. Maybe it was the underage drinking, but my friends, and I was underage too, but we all started fucking having a hard time staying awake. And I remember the Bushwhackers doing some bullshit fucking promo about instant replay or slow motion or something. Um, and then all of a sudden, you had your fucking main event, Slaughter and Hogan for it all, baby. And I like that match because, I mean, both of those guys were getting older at that point, although Hogan still had another 10 years in his career, uh, at least. And Slaughter was getting older, but, I mean, I thought those two motherfuckers tore it up. <clears throat> You know what I mean? I'm joking. I'm so excited. But I think what people don't remember, a lot of fans who were watching WrestleMania 7 probably didn't fucking, you know, know that Slaughter had that whole career beforehand of, you know, fighting Bob Backlund and Chicken Wings and fucking the Iron Sheik feud. So I think... I think there was quite a big contingent of 1991 fans watching WrestleMania 7 who weren't necessarily watching, you know, 1984 or or even 1981 Sergeant Slaughter. So I think, in my memories anyway, there was a lot more WWF fans. There was a different breed of fan, and I just don't know if all of the residents of Sergeant Slaughter carried with him into that fucking feud with Hogan just because I appreciated the fact that these two guys really were kind of competing for the same all-American top babyface spot in early Hulkamania WWF days. Um, and I don't know if all fans truly got that. Maybe some did, maybe some didn't. Uh, but it was, I thought it was a good match. All right, so any other thoughts? I think you had a lot of celebrities at WrestleMania 7 because it was in L.A., so I think you had more. You had your Bob Eukers. Was was Vanna White still there? Was she back again? Was fucking Mary Hart there again? Or Cab Calloway? I mean, you didn't have... I mean, WrestleMania 2 had 25 fucking celebrities. WrestleMania 7, I think, had 10 or something. I don't think there was any celebrities wrestling, unless I'm forgetting something. Piper, I thought, no offense, I love Roddy Piper, don't get me wrong, but I remember watching this fucking WrestleMania, and I think it was like Piper and fucking Gorilla or something, or was it Piper and Vince who did the commentary, and I, no offense, man, because I love Piper, but I, Piper, to me, was not a great babyface commentator. As a heel commentator in Georgia or other places, he might have been great, but I mean, here in WWF... In 91, 92, uh, it was bad. And the worst was fucking Savage and Piper as double babyface commentators with Vince. I hated that team. They were just so over the top. Um, moving forth, WrestleMania 8. Okay, now I'm in North Carolina, right? And I'm kind of doing the whole North Carolina gimmick. And my schmaltz was... I didn't see this one live. I think this was the first WrestleMania since three. So three, four, five, six, and seven that I found a way to see live. And my mom uh, taped, VHS taped WrestleMania two and sent it to me. Nice of her. And she sat through and watched it. She wasn't a huge fan, but she watched because I watched. And she sent me the VHS and I watched it um, with a gent uh, named Matt Lennack from Princeton, New Jersey. Fuck. And uh, we watched this WrestleMania. I think we watched it in one or two shots. And, and I had this fucking TV VCR combo, 13 inches, okay? Color. And at the time, it was not a problem. It was enjoyable. And what, what, I, what can I say about WrestleMania 8 other than somehow the fucking pay-per-view feed went askew. And like the Rick Martel fucking Tatanka match got cut off. I'll give credit to Lendak. He really popped for Rick Martel, the model. 
And he really liked this thing that Martel would say, I've got reservations about the wrestling Tatanka. And fucking Lundek popped over that line. Uh, because he's a Native American. Um, they had a big clusterfuck of an eight-man. I think it was like the Bushwhackers, Hacksaw, and fucking Sergeant Slaughter. Maybe against the Beverly Brothers and whoever the fucks. Like the the Quebecers or the Mounties or some other fucking assholes or, or fucking the Bolsheviks or something. So mid-card mania at its finest. Um, obviously the match of this show, the match that kind of stole the undercard at least, was fucking Bret Hart and fucking uh, Roddy Piper once again. So once again, Roddy Piper, a year removed from doing commentary, as now... Um, fuck, I know I just picked my nose, but it's kind of like a side pick. It wasn't a, a deep penetration, okay? But I'm saying that fucking Piper and um, Bret Hart had a good match. Blood um, in the match. Great match. Nice finish for that match. Really kind of a passing of the torch if you look at that match. The Piper-Bret, you could say because Hogan wouldn't pass the torch properly to Bret. You can say that Piper was kind of passing the torch from, like, the real classic era of, of WWF, you know, mid-80s, into the New Attitude era, or, or whatever the fuck they call it, the New Generation era, the, kind of the Brett Sean, you know, click era, whatever you want to fucking call it. And I'd say that this match, Piper versus Brett, might be the only thing you can really put your finger on, like, hey... Is there a match that was the passing of the torch from, you know, call it the fucking classic era, passing the torch to, uh, what do they call it, the fucking, uh, the new era, or the, the new fucking, whatever, the, the fucking early 90s WWF, like the 93... I think they called it the uh, the new era or just something lame like that or the fucking new people era, the new superstars, whatever the fuck it was. It wasn't the Attitude Era, it was something else. Um, but I guess you could kind of put, you know, Brett, you know, as Brett and Sean, where that was pretty much their deal with Diesel and Scott Hall and, and the one, two, three kid, you know, quickly following up on that. But I think you got to say that the Piper handing over that Intercontinental title, if you had to pinpoint a fucking match, that was it for that changing of the guard. Um, what else? I'd say, uh, and, and Circumcept, if you had to say what was the new Attitude Era handing over the guard to the Attitude Era, I'd say it was Sean at WrestleMania 14 losing to fucking Stone Cold. So there you go. Wow, I'm a genius when it comes to this shit. Uh, next... Oh, boy. Um, I think they... Did Tito Santana beat Papa Shango on a dark match? Yeah, I never got this. Tito beat fucking Papa Shango on a dark match, yet Papa Shango interferes in the main event, if you call it that, the Sid Justice fucking Hogan, and I threw that at you. Because in my book, sorry, world title match, at the time the world title meant something. There wasn't two world titles in one federation. Ric Flair and Randy fucking Savage tore the fucking house down. And I know the whole cancellation of Savage and, I mean, of of fucking Flair and and fucking uh, Hogan. But I kind of like that Savage-Flair match. And, you know, I like that Flair bled. And I don't care if if Flair and Brett both bled. I I fucking like that match. Um, And the Hogan-Sid thing... You know, it's been well documented. It was just kind of a lumber fuck. You know, it wasn't a very good match, but... And I guess Papa Shango missed his cue. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I like Charles Wright and everything. In fact, he's a cool dude, but... I mean, you can't miss your fucking cue at fucking WrestleMania, okay? I mean, miss your cue at a fucking house show in Detroit. No offense to Detroit. But it's Russell fucking goddamn mania. Don't miss your cue. Um, so that match kind of had a clusterfuck of an end. Now we move forth to WrestleMania 9. And here I was coming to my father's home. Um, You know, I was there for a wedding. And I remember being in my dad's home watching this WrestleMania 9, not expecting to even get to see it. But here I am watching it by myself in this little fucking tiny room with a TV aglow. 
And if you had to sit there, and I know guys, see, this is another thing. These are why I'm doing these videos as a keepsake, of a fan's keepsake, because I watch the Wrestle Talk guys, I watch all these fucking guys, the Laps fan with Meltzer, and I listen to all these assholes. And what they do is fine. It's good, actually, because I enjoy those videos. But what happens, and I started to watch, like, either a Cultaholic or a fucking old Wrestle Talk thing today, and the guy's listing from worst to best, the WrestleMania main events. And he starts with the very worst, and he's British, okay? And he starts with the very worst, and he says it's fucking Hulk and Yoko at WrestleMania 9. And he's like, the main event is the last match. And I'm like, well, wait a fucking dick fuck. How do you promote a main event if it's not announced? So now you're telling me that Hulk and Yoko was the main event, but it was never promoted. You know, so it's a mystery main event. It's a bonus main event. Um, so that whole main event thing really is another discussion. But it's like, dude, um, that WrestleMania 9, yes, if you watch it now, if you compare it to, say, WrestleMania 17, or even the WrestleMania we just had, or the one before that, you'd probably say that WrestleMania 9 comes up short. It didn't have a lot of great matches. Um, it had a fucking cluster shitty fucking end to the fucking Shawn Michaels match was really one of the top guys going there and they had some count out or some DQ bullshit finish and yeah, I didn't particularly like seeing Hogan get the belt that night, you know, either. It was weird and wacky, but, um, my point is thus at the fucking time, if you were a WWF fan you weren't going to WWF to see fucking, you know, Sting vs. Vader or fucking Barry Windham vs. Ric Flair. Uh, you were seeing what you were seeing. So this Hogan match with, um, it wasn't as bad, you know, maybe as, as they try to make it seem, I guess, is what I'm trying. I'm trying to get to the fact that I'm saying that the Hogan, Hogan fucking match at WrestleMania 9 and the beefcake and the whole angle... I kind of dug the show just because I hadn't seen a WWF show in a long time. And and seeing this show was fun. It was cool to see Jim Ross there, I got to admit. You know, in the toga and everything. But seeing Jim Ross with WWF after all that time as a hardcore, you know, non-WWF guy was pretty exciting and innovative. Um, I'm trying to think if the fucking Rockers, because they were the exciting, innovative team. Were they still together? No, they were broke it up for at least a fucking a year or so at least right or some whatever the fuck any fucking cunt way pardon my french but i'm french um wrestlemania 9 it was just a fun show i think it would have helped if a couple of the matches were like really good if you had like one or two really good say the Shawn michaels to talk a match had a real finish even if Shawn won or say that Tatanka won the IC and Sean got it back a week later or something. If you had a, a slightly better undercard, it probably would have just been a lot better show for the history books. Or say, was this the one with Undertaker and, and Giant Gonzalez? Say that ended in a clean finish and say, say Undertaker beat somebody else because the Giant, no offense to him, rest his soul, but... He couldn't really do a good match either. So if say you had giant uh, fucking Undertaker versus you know Bob Backlund or Scott Hall or something, you, this, yeah, like say that Undertaker versus Scott Hall, Undertaker versus Razor Ramon, shall I say? If that had been on the undercard, this show would have been greatly more better remembered. Let's put it that way. And I know they probably wouldn't put Razor Ramon, who was still a, a heel, but it was getting a lot of cheers already. They probably wouldn't have sacrificed him against the Taker because Undertaker at the time was still wrestling goofs. He was wrestling the Monster of the Week, the Creep Show, Creature Feature, you know? Uh, Bundies and Giants and fucking Gonzaleses and everyone. So the point of the matter is this. You know, if you're going to book a main event situation like the Brett Yoko Hogan deal with kind of a screwy finish... The move as a booker, if anyone's listening, not that I've ever booked a fucking territory, okay? But I'm just saying that the logical move is, hey, if we're going to do some screwy shenanigans for our main event, let's pepper this thing 
with something people can hang their hat on. A solid, you know, a solid uh, mid-card title match and a solid tag team tag team match. Whether it's tag team titles or not. Uh, what was the tag team match? It was Hogan and fucking Beefcake and some Money, Inc., which was not a great match either. Um, and Hogan had that weird fucking black eye. And we still don't know the whole story behind that. The kayfabe story was that fucking, um, that like Money Inc. sent out assassins or bodyguards or, be, you know, some guys to beat up Hogan in his eye. It really did look atrocious when Hogan was wrestling at WrestleMania 9 with that fucking black eye. And it looked like, is this guy, should he even be here? I mean, Hogan. And you can answer that, you know, if you don't like Hogan, say, well, of course he shouldn't be there, but. I, I just, it was a, it was a very ugly eye, okay, and I don't know what the fuck to tell you, except it, it was just, it was what it was, uh, but WrestleMania 9, if you watch that show now, and I think a lot of these guys, no offense to them, but some of these, you know, online people who analyze wrestling from, from shit that they didn't even watch at the time, what they don't necessarily get is you just a lot of times when you watch a wrestling show, your mood, your modality, where you are with your life, your personal life, and your wrestling life has an influence on how you enjoy the show. So if you're pissed off at the world and you see a pretty decent but not great show, you might think it sucks or you might think it's the greatest show ever because it cheered you up a little bit. In this particular situation, WrestleMania 9 to me was like a happy surprise because I didn't think I was going to see it. So to see it, and even if it was a little goofy or carny or just just schmaltz, WWF schmaltz, and I was really a WCW fan at the time, it didn't bother me as much because I was just grateful for it. You see what I'm saying? So that all being said, I still... Like I was saying, if you know you can't make a fucking time machine, but if you could, you'd have the Undertaker versus Razor Ramon, or um, you know, I don't know if the were the Beverly Brothers on that fucking show. Have them flop around for the Steiners or just something. But any fucking cunt way, uh, WrestleMania nine. I think I probably left a little pissed that Hogan got the belt, but not terribly caring that much. Because I was really, like, you know, NWA, WCW, whatever the fuck it was at that time, was really my sweet spot. So, this has been your fucking WrestleMania 7, 8, and 9 Wrestle Ride. I even prolonged the ride, you know, just for you, and you, and you. And, you know, the, if it's 27 people watching this, or, or three, uh, the Damons, the Aarons, the Eds, all the friends who, who watch these Wrestle Rides... Uh, they know that this is my testimony to, to life as a wrestling fan because you have all this fucking knowledge in your head. There's really nothing to do with it, you know, and at some point you're just like another one of these guys. Now I do want to say I did a Bruno San Martino tribute, but there's guys in this area that I live in that if you mention wrestling, they'll say, oh yeah, I used to go to Jack Witchie's and she... Bruno Sammartino, Chief Sting Strongbow, Haystack Calhoun. They'll always say those three fucking guys. It's like clockwork. You can talk to anybody in New England and they'll mention Jack Witchies. I don't know if it was Jack Richies or Jack Witchies with a W. And they always say Bruno Sammartino, Chief J Strongbow, Haystack Calhoun. And it's almost always in that fucking order. So I wonder if these guys were like MK Ultra victims who got, you know, <laughs> Bruno San Martino, Chief J. Strongbow, Haystack he, Calhoun. But, you know, Andre um, the Giant, you know, funny because I mentioned that Bruno had passed away to a friend of mine who's not a big wrestling fan, but he knows a little bit. And he said, oh, my goodness, it was just a couple of years ago that Andre died. I said, dude, that wasn't a couple of years ago. That was like fucking 25 years ago he fucking died. So anyway, folks, it's my goddamn Messier with your fucking WrestleRide remembrance of WrestleMania 7 through 9, and I hope you enjoyed it.